Okay, so today we're going to start talking, we're going to go for a while here, but we're going to start talking today about protected area, uh, protected areas generally speaking, right? Um, and, and the different flavors of those and, and, and how we conceptualize protected areas. So we're going to start uh, today with sort of a high level kind of um, mile high view of what we, how we think of protected areas. Um, key elements, that kind of stuff, and then uh, in future discussions, we'll go into more specific details of um, our California story and other other uh, uh, aspects of protected areas. Um, so we'll also start with this from yesterday as well. So I'm here looking um, over Guadalupe Canyon on the sort of northern edge, roughly north northwestern edge of San Bruno Mountain. We're looking towards the peak. The peak you can see. Um, where all of these radio towers uh, exist, transmission towers exist now. And this is the core of the protected area of this, um, this coastal protected area that was originally proposed for the entirety of this chunk to be shaved off and dumped into San Francisco Bay off to the left of us and converted into some kind of massive city. Um, and also this is the, the initiation point of the modern habitat conservation uh, planning um, approach, multi-species approach to protected area designation. But what we see here is we're on the edge. If I, if I pan right over here, you'll see the development is, is encroached right up here onto the core of San Bruno Mountain. And, um, and then if we were to look up that way, we'd see um, you know, the rest of the Bay Area. Uh, and basically what we have going on here is the core area in there, edge habitat around here, and then heavy development. We have mixes of grasslands, uh, uh, shrublands, um, a pretty uh, heavily foggy area. So there's a lot of relative fog drip, a lot of relative moisture here. Um, the charismatic species here that are most noteworthy are butterflies, um, a, a, a suite of, of several species of butterflies now that are endangered. Um, in particular, their host plants um, were found in this in this San Bruno mountain area, which is why those butterflies are here. And um, this area is uh, an interesting example for uh, carving out space as urbanization surrounds you. So this is literally an island now in the middle of this urban San Francisco, South San Francisco, Daly City uh, complex and uh, is really functioning as such. So island biogeography theory applies, all those important um, concepts apply. Um, and an, an interesting example, both for management history and how we approach the wider coastal zone, um, but also how we adapt to climate change um, and all these other things. So as we look into the rising sun, there's a, a eucalyptus grove right there. Um, eucalyptus, obviously non-native, but have become, um, you know, fairly important in their own right for certain um, species support. So how we manage this changing composition of critters, how we manage the continual pressure of urbanization and fragmentation, how we um, make sure that we're providing uh, multiple benefits to folks. Uh, ongoing challenge in San Bruno, San Bruno Mountain here in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, is a really interesting example for how we went about protecting areas and how we'll go about doing that in the future to assure the survival of species, uh, ecosystems, and, uh, and recreational opportunities. So uh, before uh, I go into some of the concepts, I wanted to take a, a few minutes here and have you guys get in the right uh, mindset and, and chat amongst yourselves. So I'd like you guys to brainstorm um, some of the key aspects of protected areas generally that, you, that you're aware of from your other classes, from Kong's bio, from mm -hmm. other things. So, so um, Okay, so those are all those are all good good suggestions, good ideas, good uh, 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 concepts that relate in some way, shape, or form to the idea of protected area stuff. I want to first start off talking about um, contrasting how most of in your previous classes you've mostly talked about, or most of our life experience, how we typically thought about protected areas um, versus protected areas in the ocean and, and the coastal zone. So, the most important difference between protected areas on land and protected areas out uh, in, the, in the sea um, has to do with the ecology of the common critters that we encounter that occupy 
our areas. Now, the classic thing would be what we now would refer to as a closed population organism. So the classic example there would be a deer in a valley. So that deer in a valley, we have, we have a valley and we have a bunch of deer, and let's say you and I are studying them and, we're, and, and, and you know, V is saying like, hey, how many deer are we gonna have next year or something? We would go and count the number of deer we have now and through some approach, maybe the number of moms, maybe the number of male-female ratio, whatever, we have some count now and we would guesstimate what we think the number of deer would be next year, right? Um, and, that, and generally speaking, we're pretty good at that, right? The, the number of deer, the number of pig, the number of birds, whatever. In contrast, many, 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 in fact, the majority of critters in the ocean are what we would consider so-called, so, so that was a closed population. Did I say open? I might have, said, might have said it. So, so that, that deer in a valley is a classically quote unquote closed population. Most of the critters in the ocean and marine settings are open uh, populations. And so what does that mean? What I mean is we go, let's talk about a fish on a reef. So we go check out that fish on the reef and, and we ask the same question, hey Dr. A, how many fish are we gonna have on this reef next year? We go and we scuba dive and we measure and we count and we, maybe we count the number of pregnant moms Maybe we, again, count the male to female ratio, whatever it is, and we get a number, and then we guesstimate what we think the, the number of fish are gonna be next year, could be totally unrelated, completely unrelated. So there's a decoupling of the goings on in that particular time, in, or that particular location, geographic location, with the future input to that location. Doesn't have to be, but, but oftentimes it is decoupled. Why is that? That's because many of our marine critters, as I'm showing you here, have what we refer to as a bipartite life history. A two, two very different parts of their, their living of their lives. Okay, and so I'm showing that here with the, the stuff that we typically see. We, we put a mask on, we put our head under the water, or we put a fishing pole in the water and we pull a guy, and we get the adult fish, right? We get the thing we see, the, 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 the individual, <clears throat> and that, and now that is not necessarily attached. If it was a barnacle, it would be literally attached to the, to the reef right there. So that also is, is a good example of this as well. But we're talking about relatively sedentary. So it could be actual, actual sedentary, actually physically attached, like a kelp individual or a barnacle individual. But it could also be something like this a rockfish that can move around, can swim around, but basically isn't gonna leave this area. So maybe the area of the uh, classroom here, or maybe the, the area of Sierra Hall, or maybe even for that matter, the area of campus, right? But it's not gonna go a whole lot on average beyond there. So we'd say that's relatively sedentary life history phase. That's the adult phase. That's contrasted by the young phase, either the phase as an egg, the phase as a fertilized larvae floating around, or as possibly a juvenile, you know, small individual that is potentially widely dispersed. So, so the fish is, so the adult fish are on the reef and, and the, you know, maybe the female uh, releases her eggs, the male broadcast spawns over it, fertilizes, and the current maybe takes our, depending on the species, depending on the situation, maybe those fertilized embryos, those babies, those, that larvae, maybe that moves one meter away and then the larvae like settle out of the water column, like, you know, stay local. Or maybe it, they float for a day, or a week, or a month, or six months, right? And so they could potentially go stay on our reef, or go to the next reef over, or go to somewhere else in Southern California, or go somewhere else in Northern California, or go somewhere to Japan, right? And so that decoupling, that very, very common decoupling of local production and local input makes it very challenging to figure out how many individuals we'll get in a particular place in a particular year. So that's a key aspect when we think about protected areas. Everybody, everybody cool with that? Everybody with me on that one? Okay, cool. Um, another uh, aspect that, that makes it um, oftentimes a little bit uh, more challenging to talk about protected areas in an ocean context is um, uh, what, uh, we sometimes call, uh, bio, people, the fisheries biologists call this BOFFN, uh, big old fecund females, or those other terms, but basically 
But basically, um, here's this on this rockfish, on this vermilion rockfish on the left, right? So an individual, and this is all real data, right? So this is um, this guy who's about a little more than a foot in total length, right? That individual is going to produce some, or theoretically over, you know, uh, over this time period, that individual can produce something like 150,000 eggs or 150,000 potential offspring, right? But as we get bigger, oftentimes many of our marine critters, the production doesn't scale linearly. So if we have a, a, a bear that's twice the size, maybe that bear is, is twice as likely to be able to defend its, its territory or, or, or bring in food for the babies or, you know, you know stronger, right? You know, that, you know, bigger, stronger. Okay, that makes sense. But what we have oftentimes in the marine world is an exponential relationship with size and potential output and therefore potential input. And so, so the, the dude that's a bit, or the lady actually, that's a bit larger than a foot is about 150,000 potential eggs. The one that's about two feet is more like 1.7 million eggs, right? So it's, it, there's, there are these nonlinear relationships. So we have this decoupled bipartite life history, and then the simple uh, uh, size differences or the simple uh, linear relationships don't necessarily hold. Yeah, okay. So, and then let me, should I do this? Okay, I'll do this slide, then, then I'll pause for a second. Okay, so, so the, the core of our thinking of protected areas comes from our worry about biodiversity, our worry about the biological resources and the potential stress or the potential degradation of those biological resources. And so our, our uh, sort of the pinnacle of traditional thinking about protected area uh, uh, conceptualization has um, what we would call in the, in the area where the people can fish, we call it a no-take reserve or an area where people aren't allowed to go, a people, or people aren't allowed to trample across the meadows, you know, whatever that is. The idea is we don't have an impact. We humans don't have an impact in this area. And another term for that is a biological reserve. Um, there are many terms for these things. But, but with this sort of core idea, sort of, you know, traditionally thought of as the ultimate in terms of protected area, goal, the basic assumption is that if we protect well-functioning ecosystems, if we protect something that where the trees are there and the water's there and all the, all the elements are there, that is a highly effective way to maintain whatever that biological aspect that we're talking about is. That could be, that could be a population, that could be a species, or that could be a, a whole community or assemblage or you know, ecosystem. Uh, that idea really is an American idea and is, is deeply rooted in the l mid to late 1800s in the US thinking, right? This was the time that produced the beginnings of our national, our thinkings of national parks and all that kind of good stuff. And really emerged from our idea of wilderness with the idea that Again, at this, in this time in the U.S., this was the big industrial revolution is going off. All these big factories are, ha are going on. People are leaving the rural areas, moving to urban uh, centers and working in factories under you know, slavish conditions, under bad conditions. And it's oftentimes unhealthy, right? People living in close quarters. We have a lot of disease spreading. We don't have modern hygiene that, that we would t typically think of. And so it sort of builds on this idea that the human places are, are bad and the nature places are good. And so an extension of that is even better as if there's, if, if there's no people around. And so that births our idea of wilderness and um, Thoreau and all the existential, uh, all, all the romanticists and all those um, uh, important uh, thinkers uh, that, that get us to this, to this idea. Okay, so let's... Um, Let's uh, fill in some of this, this table here. Deep, yes, right. So midwater, which again is the most common biosphere on the planet, right? We, we talked about the average depth of the ocean, the average depth of the ocean being four kilometers deep, right? 
And so uh, most of that area between the you know, shallow waters and the bottom, that's all midwater. And that is where most, that's the largest potential place for life to exist on Earth, right? You and I, we can't really go there, right? We can't go there. We can send some t technology down, but even sending technology down, we can't really remain there, right? Unless we're in some kind of crazy nuclear powered submarine or something weird. But for the most part, we can't get there. So, um, so we have, we have uh, you know, these, these analogs. The difference is, where it, is it terrestrial? Most of the terrestrial place is uh, on the planet is in this box, right? Most of the ocean world is in this box, right? So that's a huge contrast. And it's easy to sort of get, but it's, it's really, really important. It's fundamental to all of our thinking and planning for these things, right? So, okay, what else? Um, uh, okay, then I have a middle ground here. So this is fixed, or, or quote unquote normal and, and hard to get to. There's also potentially in the in between time, there's a dynamic uh, 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 um, landscape or seascape. Many of these, these, most of these are related to catastrophes or disasters. So, um, a big map, so let's, let's take the terrestrial example. So here's my, here, um, uh, a, a classic example of this. A uh, classic example of this came up um, several years ago. When was that? 2007 floods? I can't remember. So 2000, well, one of our big flood events um, out in, um, well, across, across Southern California, but it had the effect of huge amount of rains, uh, rains dumping in the Santa Clara River and then a bunch of heavy flows and the way some debris got caught up, the water went, instead of going straight down the channel, went a bit sideways near the Santa Paula airport. And so the banks got undercut to the airport. So whereas the, the river was like, you know, the, you know, it, it's probably everybody here knows, right? The Santa Clara is sometimes really, really wet, sometimes really, really mostly dry. So it's a very flashy, classic Mediterranean type of, type of riparian system. But in this particular storm event, it basically did this. It like, you know, kind of did a big cutout. Many of the legal definitions for what is city, what is county, what is state, that kind of stuff, right? Or, or, or what's your property line? Old, old property boundaries were defined by things like this. So now, the, there's, 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 under, there's undercutting of the road and, and p getting close to the runway on that airport. And so they want to repair it, but then suddenly cow fish, what we used to call cow fishing game, said, oh, we control all of the area that is the riverbed. And now this is riverbed. So you can't, you can't <laughs> fix your, you can't fix your, air, your uh, runway or your road or whatever. And these guys are like, what? It just, it just rained. And like, we got to fix it. Like, yeah, no. And so, so that idea of things changing under dynamic conditions, Mostly we think of rain doing this, but, but other things, earthquakes, other things, get lava flows, all this stuff can do that, right? Hawaii is our only state in the union where we're actively adding a, a, a terrestrial area um, you know, every, every year, right? Because we have these lava flows going and building and adding land. So, so we have this normal, hard, increasingly in the era of climate change would think sea level rise, right? We're getting areas that are that are that are not um, not fixed anymore and are kind of becoming dynamic. Ben. Is that similar to like countries who are importing sand to expand their territory? Uh, sure. So yeah. So uh, for example, the Chinese with, with their artificial islands. It's sure that would be an example of something that's dynamic. That that it started as maybe a a, a subtidal area and they've converted it to a terrestrial area, right? So, the, so those, those are uh, possible things to think about. And then, what else do I want to say? Uh, right, okay. So, so we have the terrestrial is pretty easy. Terrestrial is, is parts of our planet, the surface of which is in the air, right? Marine is pretty easy. This is the part of our planet that is, uh, you know, that there's seawater on top of it, right? Coastal 
is this interesting category. When we start getting into some of the data on protected areas, um, this is not, oh, it's, it's a little confusing. So some people say if any little bit of seawater ever touches this area, therefore then it is marine. Other people say, well, no, it depends. And then yet again, other places, we might have a protected area that starts on land, so includes some terrestrial areas, but extends into the subtitle. So, so coastal is this kind of funky in the context of defining protected areas. It's not purely terrestrial. It's not purely marine. It's this sort of betwixt between. And, that, and, and so those, those are the main things we'll be talking about. Uh, key themes here, again, terrestrial, most of what we talk about or the, or the potential palette of what we might do is mostly normal and fixed and accessible. Marine, most of the area is, is hard to get to and uncontrolled and, and all that kind of stuff. The other thing to say is terrestrial is basically governed by the laws of, of the, whatever the country is or the state or the, the political organization that controls that territory. Most of the potential areas in the world ocean are outside of exclusive economic zones, outside of jurisdictional control. So they're in the so-called open sea or the open ocean. So we don't necessarily have a legal governance structure that, that is saying how to, you know, how, to, how, to, how to do the do, okay? Another one that I wanna mention is mostly, and because most of this water, or most of the area we're talking about in terms of protected areas in the open ocean is in the water column, it is or associated with the water column, we have the possibility of having not just, not just normal areas, hard to get to areas, but this dynamic area also has another, so mostly in the terrestrial realm and the coastal realm, we're talking about disasters are really what, uh, what triggers our thinking about dynamic stuff. One second, Sebastian. And, and the last little bit is with marine, we can talk about, and people have now proposed, and you have a, I think you guys, I gave you guys a reading on this. Um, I might have made it optional, um, but is this idea of a protected area that is ephemeral. So instead of a protected area that starts this year and is going to be in per perpetuity from this Latin lawn to that Latin lawn to that lawn, it's something that might wink into existence tomorrow and might last for a day, might last for a week, might last for a month and then vanish. And so the classic things here would be gyres, right? So, so a big concentration, so, so you know, the cur swirling currents that are defining sort of a, a, a more or less defined mass of water, usually the kind of things we can see from satellites. So usually we're talking about surface waters here. And so it starts here and, and, and everybody has figured this out. So, so the exploitation experts have figured this out 50, 75 years ago. So now most large tuna vessels and most large open sea fisher uh, uh, trawlers and things, they all fish with satellites. They do not fish with old grandpa that's been doing this for 50 years, knows where to go. No, no, no. They get real time data feeds from Elon Musk and national weather satellites and all that kind of stuff. And they go, hey, where is, where is the chlorophyll concentrated right now on the surface of the ocean? Aha, uh -huh, it's right here. We're gonna go put our nets right there. So they will chase they will use our modern technology to chase the resource. And so there's increasing work saying, therefore, we should have the protected areas, we should have a category of protected areas that could be dynamic, right? All the things we're gonna talk about here in terms of concepts will apply, but, but rather than a fixed in space location, it would theoretically be defined by this ephemeral condition, right? And so, and as it maybe blows north, so the protect, so the theoretical protection and, and limitations on what we can do in there would sort of float north with it. And then when it eventually would dissipate, again, who knows, a week, a month, whatever, then, then the protections would... Uh, we don't have laws yet to move with it, but, that, but that's the concept, but that's the concept, yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, because this is, all in the open, this is all in the open ocean, so it's not like it's in US territory or something. So, so um, okay, cool. And there was one other one I want to mention. Oh, then the last one I just want to mention was just for completeness, nobody's done this yet, but 
so as hard as that is to talk about gyre, sort of dynamic marine protected areas, that, that's, that's real hard. Theoretically, there could be another one. Theoretically, just for completion, we could talk about atmospheric or stuff in the air, um, which sounds kind of crazy, but as we're moving to um, flying taxis and flying drones and stuff, this might be something we want to think about. Just like we've thought about the volume of water is something we want to protect. Maybe we want to protect the volume of air. So, um, That's right. That is exactly correct. That is exactly correct. Okay, so that makes sense? So we have this sort of landscape here we're talking about of, of where we might, you know, kind of theoretically plop down some considerations for, for protected area. Okay, so let's talk a little more. Oh, sorry, questions about that? Make sense? Okay, sorry, Sebastian, you had a question, but I didn't. Okay, sorry. Okay, so again, the basic assumption, the, the theoretical, the traditional idea is that the best thing is where people aren't. The best thing is where we, we just set this thing aside just for the non-human components of the planet. Okay. So I want to read a couple quotes for you guys. And so, um, we, some, so we now, the, the state of the art when we talk about something that touches the ocean, uh, the generic term for all these things, protected area. We sometimes use open space, parks, uh, you know, there, there's different terms we use, but protected area is the most generic term. And then for the stuff that touches the sea, we usually add the word marine on there, so marine or MPA, um, all good. Before we got into that formal language though, the term, like when I was coming up, the term was marine reserves. So, that, so there's a, a lot of terms that mean basically the same thing, even though we have more rigorous definitions now. So let's talk about this idea of marine reserves. So here's, a, here's some quotes. So let me read this. You guys look up here and let me read this. I'm going to ask a question of you guys in a second. During my recent visit to, Catalina, to Santa Catalina Island, I was deeply impressed with the threatened danger to the commercial and valued sport giving fisheries at the island. The island for three or four miles offshore is the spawning ground of the valuable food fishes of Southern California, and particularly of Los Angeles, and that this region should be protected absolutely from all kinds of nets or lines handled for commercial or market purposes. That's one quote. Okay, the next quote, uh, and this for, that's from a, a researcher. The next one is from a, 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 state, a state report. And so it says, fishing, ground, fishing around Catalina Island over the previous 30 years decreased stocks to the extent that the supply has dropped off to a menacing extent due to lack of laws, lack of protection, and overfishing, blah, blah, blah. The angling here in blank to blank was the most remarkable in the world. But with the coming of powerboats and seines and trawls and other nets, the fisheries began to decrease until it was evident that something must be done. The most menacing danger was the alien who attached a gill net to the kelp and ran it out to sea. 50 such nets have been seen, uh, have been counted, excuse me, in a mile and a half. So my question to you is, what do you think these two years were? So, so um, the, the angling, so the fishing here between X and Y was the most remarkable in the world, but now has gotten devastated. So I want to, so you guys think about it, and I want to hear your guesses. So, so give me your guesses as to what, what years you think we're talking about here. Where am I? The 30 year? Uh, correct. Oh, okay. uh, well, no, so, no, it said the fishing over the previous 30 years. So, so it could be 30 years, but it could be something else. But, so, so when do you guys think fishing was the best in the world off of Catalina? Hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Sure. Everything. Most abundant, biggest fish, uh, 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 most diverse fish, whatever. Okay. So, ready, set, go. Give me some numbers. 1850. 1850. Uh, okay, the, the first one is, the first one's 1850. What's the second one? So, so it's between blank to blank. 1850 to 19. Okay, somebody else. Mid, mid 1900s is, was our guess, right? Here's the answer. Yeah. 1886 to 1900, right? We get trapped. We get trapped into thinking, oh my God, we just screwed up the planet. 
oh my God, we're never going to be able to recover. Oh my God, this and that. We've been intersecting, we've been manipulating, we've been engaging with our home planet for millennia, you know, millions of years. And so this, which, I mean, there's, there's old language and stuff about aliens and crap, but, but, but other than that stuff, this is a, I think this is a fairly modern thing, right? I mean, the language is old timey and stuff, but basically it's like saying, hey dude, um, we used to have kick butt uh, of this resource and now it's messed up. And everybody and their brother is doing all these things and we're not controlling it, we're not, we gotta, we gotta take some action, right, is, is the basic idea. So in the wake of this, this report was in 19, so this first quote was 1912, the second quote was 1913, right? So 110 years ago, right? Uh, not last week or not last month or not last decade or whatever. And so in the wake of this, people were freaked out. So we were freaked out. And so, and, and again, this might be a little bit hard for us to understand, but um, there's this one great restaurant in Palo Alto that just closed that I really want to bid on this one old historic photograph of people fishing in Catalina in the early 1900s. I think I might be missed the auction, but you know, shocker. Um, but in any event, um, uh, really, really important. It's hard for us to understand what Catalina was like in this time, right? So there's a boat straight off, there's a big population center, boat straight off, there's the casino, you go gamble, you go ballroom dance, you go fish all, all day. It was a place where like Hemingway would go and like drink all night and write story. It was, it was, it was a big, big happening place. Hollywood was there, they do movie premieres, like, like, like movie premieres for the world would be done out there. It was a really intensely used space. And so the fishing was very, very intense. And so, and, and so then people are going out and they're starting to see this, starting to see this change, very rapid change from just a few years ago when I was here or when I was a kid, now it looks different. And so in the wake of this, night, uh, the wake of this state report, um, the state established out to three nautical miles what we would now call an MPA, what they called a marine reserve. Um, and they said no, no net based fishing, no, no gill nets. Um, and it lasted for less than a year because the political pressure got so big. Um, th there was a, um, we, we now think of LA, uh, LA Long Beach as an important port, which it absolutely is, but um, we think of it now as, a sh as primarily a moving materials around port, bringing in energy, bringing in containers. But back then, it was doing that, but also really, really important, um, a food port, for a fishing landing place, right? So there was a big fishing fleet there. And so the, the fishing lobby basically said, especially the, 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 the canning, the fish canning industry, which was based in San Pedro, they're like, no way, we gotta go back to fishing. So this first attempt at a marine protected area fails. Right? Or I shouldn't say fails, but it starts, but it quickly is aborted. This is what we're talking about. So that over there is, um, uh, we now call a giant sea bass. We call it black sea bass. Now we call it giant sea bass. That, and that lady in the dress caught that fish, right? So it didn't, you didn't have to be some macho Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was a, this, I mean, this was a big fish to be sure, but this was not that uncommon. These giant sea basses are, or the, are the historically were and are thankfully this is a conservation success story more on this later when we get to fisheries but um they're coming back these are the apex predator on our reefs this guy like look at that dude's mouth it's it's like if he opens his mouth his mouth goes like this like whole lobster gulped up right i mean like like massive vacuum and nobody there's the adults at least were so big, nobody really screws with them. So they just like, what? You know, they just kind of cruise along like, what's that? I'm gonna eat that, right? So really, really important part of our Southern California uh, uh, shallow water reef ecosystem. Uh, the first time I saw a big one, wasn't even close to that big, it was probably half that size, but because their populations had been knocked down so much, it was an unusual thing and I almost, uh, soiled myself underwater. I was like, what? It was like, this, I, thought, I thought the sea monster was coming out. I mean, they're so big. They look it's, it's like, you see it come out of the kelp and it does not look like a normal fish. So this was what our reefs were like. Here's another one. There's a, a lady that landed a white sea bass, right? Common size white sea bass. Now we think that's a big honking white sea bass. 
Um, and our white sea bass are also doing well, a relatively well-managed fishery. But again, this was common. This was what was going on in the lower right at Catalina in the early 1900s that predicated those comments and the reports. So I mean, just have this one little look, right? This one look. I got, I've got, um, so here's a net. Each of these guys has a net. So here's a net. Here's a boat, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Just in this little uh, view, there's 13. And what these guys are doing is they're putting out these nets. And in this case, these guys are getting bait fish that they'll use to then sell to the other fishermen to, to put on their hooks to go get bigger fish. Um, but the point is very, very intense exploitation, very concentrated exploitation, and no size limit, no season. It was just get fish all day long, every single day, everywhere you want to get them, right? So that was at the core of this initial concern about marine protected areas. We'll do two more slides and we'll take a little, little, little uh, uh, break in a second. Um, so this is where we are as of this month, right now. Let me explain these things first. Um, so this is uh, terrestrial, and even though uh, lakes, uh, rivers are not terrestrial, I get that, but in terms of the global um, inventorying of protected areas, we usually put those in with the terrestrial uh, world. Okay, so, so when we say terrestrial, that's, that's land and freshwater uh, uh, dealio, okay? Uh, okay, so, so, this is, so this is land, and then this is marine, okay? And so, and, and, and the coastal here are, is not really broken down, but this is just to give you guys the picture. Okay, so, so um, we have a lot of protected areas. We're going to talk about the categories later, but I'll just say there's a lot of different categories, a lot of different flavors of protected areas. <laughs> But in our, the one master data, the best master database that we have right now, which is maintained in the UK, um, says as of this month, uh, a little bit less than 267,000 distinct uh, geographic areas, right? If you add up all those areas, and again, I'm not saying they're all great and they're all perfect and they're all working well, but let's just, for the time being, our, starting our discussion, we're just going to say, what's the, the we're just going to assume that they all have some level of protection. That would account, uh, that would uh, amount to about 16% of Gesundheit, of the, of the two-dimensional space on the surface of the Earth. Okay? If we talk about the, the surface of the ocean, under which is a, is a marine protected area, that's about 8% of the um, planet. Now, something, again, we'll talk about later, but just because the statistics now... Uh, uh, four or five years ago, I didn't have to do this. But now, starting in 2018, this is now introduced to all of our UN stuff, and we can talk about it. But, but we now have this additional category that was first introduced by the Convention of Biological Diversity in, in 2010 and really started to get more codified just essentially just before COVID. But you'll now start to see, in addition to PA, or protected area, or MPA for marine protected area, you'll also see this acronym O E C M, and that stands for Other Effective Conservation Measures. I'll just say that this is an evolving thing. Some people think this should be considered as part of the protected area theory. Theory. Some people don't, but we'll just leave it aside. It's essentially a more generous definition of how we protect biological resources. Um, and and so even if you consider all of those things, it only bumps up the percent protection on land by about a percent and uh, uh, barely scratches the surface in terms of the, the extent of the marine protected area. Okay? One more slide and then we'll, we'll break. So, so the only thing you need to know is about 16%, I, I just, let's just focus this, about 16% on land, about half of that in the ocean. Okay? All right. So, uh, Let's talk about this, our first introduction to marine protected areas, and we'll break. Okay, so this is as of today. Again, MPA, marine protected area. Uh, a real important quote from Hack, this old paper by Hackman. I don't think I give this paper to you guys anymore. Um, but um, argues that the marine protected areas that we have around the planet, especially, especially 30 years ago, um, are more by opportunity than design. 
Another way to say that is scenery rather than science. And that, I, and so he's talking about marine protected areas, but I would argue that was the, that's the case for most protected areas, right? Why is the Grand Canyon where the Grand Canyon is? Because it's beautiful and it's cool and it's awe-inspiring and it's awesome, right? Why didn't we save the, the prairie in, in Iowa or whatever? Because, because people wanted it, right? And so, and so all of that. Okay, as of this month, we have uh, 18, th the database says we have 18,431 res reserves, these are marine protected areas, um, in more than 80 countries. Uh, I'll just say we have some very, very large, uh, you know, in terms of two-dimensional extent, very large MPAs in terms of acreage, in terms of size. So the largest one was just designated before COVID. Uh, it's called the Ross Sea region. This is down in Antarctica. And this is a, a bit more than 2 million square kilometers. This is a huge area that is um, getting protection. Uh, we also have, uh, in, the, in Kiribati, um, we also have what people usually, they usually don't say the whole word, they usually say PIPA, is usually what people will say, P-I-P-A, and that stands for the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. That's really big. Where is that? Uh, in the uh, Western Pacific, so Southwestern Pacific, in Kiribati. So it looks like the word looks the the, the country looks like uh, Kiribati, but it's pronounced Kiribati. Um, and uh, and that that's about that's a little bit less than half a million square kilometers. Other big ones uh, are uh, include uh, include um, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So this is not the seven main islands of of the Big Island and Kauai, whatever. But that those are part of a contiguous chain. And if we continue off into the, the Western Pacific past Kauai and Niihau, uh, those, th that, that chain of islands, that's the Northwestern, uh, uh, and, and they're, they're basically unoccupied. There's sometimes a few, like a research base or whatever, but they're basically not, not routinely occupied by regular folks. That's 1.5 million square kilometers. Uh, other big ones are the Great Barrier Reef, where I was diving a few weeks ago. Um, which is perhaps one of the most famous um, uh, protected areas. That was established in 1980. And that's about uh, a third of a million uh, square kilometers. Um, Marianas Trench National Monument is also pretty darn big. It's a quarter of a, of a million square uh, kilometers. And then this, uh, this sort of patchwork of many of our distant territories in the in the Western Pacific, uh, U.S. territorial um, holdings. Um, and those, when you add them all up, they're also about a quarter of a million square kilometers. So to leave you food for thought before we break, um, so these are big. Um, uh, these are large scale marine protected areas. These are cool, great. That is not how, and so it's important to know about those. Those are unique and, and good. The vast majority of marine protected areas are much smaller, much smaller. So uh, Elkhorn Slough up in Monterey, uh, two square kilometers. Uh, Carmel Bay, four square kilometers. Wrigley out of Catalina, where I did some of my PhD work, um, is one of the oldest and one of the best enforced marine protected areas is 0 0.15 square kilometers. So, so the point here is that we have a range of size of protected areas and that yes, we have some massive, large, you know, gigante suckers. The vast majority are much, much smaller. Orders of magnitude smaller than the ones that sometimes get all the attention or the sort of, you know, factoids kind of stuff. Cool? All right. With that, let's take a 10 minute break. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's keep going here. So um, next I want to talk about um, some of the, the insights that we're, we're starting to glean before we talk about the overall principles, right? So, so one of the main goals of our use of protected areas is to try to conserve a biological resource, right? So to, as we mentioned, we're trying to have the fish be more abundant, have the deer be more abundant, have the trees be product, protected, whatever the, the um, element is. Uh, 
in, in, in classic, classic thinking. Um, and so, uh, so let's look at some of the evidence that, okay, so that's, so that's the goal. The goal is so can we, can we improve the biodiversity? Can we improve the res resilience of communities, that kind of stuff? Um, and so the first question before we get to that is, is, is there any evidence of that, right? We've been doing protected areas for um, a while now, in some places a lot longer than others, but nevertheless, do we have evidence that these things um, work or are, are, are they working or how are they working? Okay. So this is an effort from the European Union to uh, uh, do essentially diagnostics of the marine protected areas that we do have, and uh, and just you know how are they you know how are they working? And the idea here is is um, not to, to penalize anybody, but rather to just sort of say, hey, what's what is the current state of affairs in your location, and you know is it working? Is it not working? And the hope is that this is this is um, has been, been been being developed for a few years, and now it seems to be sort of stabilizing. And so the idea is that it can be used through time, so we can say, "Hey, is, is stuff getting better or whatever?" And there's various dimensions that these folks uh, have looked at. Uh, everything from uh, uh, the um, the basic needs in terms of uh, zoning and and is there information known about the site and that kind of stuff. Uh, to how much support is there in the community or at the national level, et cetera. And you can use this to sort of to, you know, go do analyses. And I just wanted to uh, show one quick pattern here, which is um, uh, we're typically used to showing X, Y figures, right? Does, does variable X influence Y, which is mostly what we do. But there are other ways to visualize stuff. And, the, and spider diagrams are really, really useful um, in terms of we have multi-dimensions but those dimensions aren't necessarily super complex in and of themselves. So things like management, different components of management. So you m might, not have, might not be familiar with these figures, so let me just show you real quick. Uh, there's one dimension here. There's one dimension. We, instead of being like an XY plot low to high, here low is in the bullet point, low is in the center. And as we radiate away from the center, the values grow. So more here, less here, right? And then we just have variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four, variable five, right? These, these, these variables may or may not be related to each other. Um, and the point of this, and if you just, it might be a little bit small for you guys to read, but I'll just say this one says anticipation, this one says awareness, uh, management's responsiveness, preparedness for the MPA, spatial planning for the MPA, uh, and, and on, on and on these different dimensions, right? And so, for example, in this particular case, we can look to see if the performance of this protected area is the same from year to year. And the fact that these, that these, the, the yellow color and the, and the blue color don't perfectly overlap, that tells us that things are changing, that things are dynamic. Either, either things are getting worse or things have, or some improvements have been made and things are getting more robust. And what I would just say is that um, there's, as we will learn shortly, um, there's different, there are different flavors, different categories of MPAs, or I should say different categories of protected areas. They don't all share um, uh, the same um, exact driving motivation, the same specific goals, right? And so, for example, this would be a case where we have a lot of support from the political establishment, right? So these, these dimensions, you can't read them, but it doesn't matter, I'll just say it. These are, over here is like, you know, institutional sort of support, funding and that kind of stuff. Over here is sort of like community buy-in and capacity at the local level. So here we say, you know, big, big on one side of the equation, but not so much in the other, right? This one is about fisheries. So this one isn't about not fishing at all. And I should say, with, with this uh, European Union, everything is anonymized. So, so while you can participate and you get the data, the idea is not to have winners and losers. The idea is to have a big picture. So we want everybody to be honest. So we don't want somebody to go through this and then say, oh, you're the worst MPA in the world. You have a zero score, right? That, that, that could be a disincentive to people volunteering and telling their information and telling us about it. So this is all anonymized. So we don't know where, this, where these exact um, uh, protected areas are. And so this, in this case, this one has um, uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on 
um, restricting commercial exploitation, but not you know, local, uh, small scale uh, uh, exploitation. And so the point is you can see these, these things manifest in different flavors. Jake, do you have a question? Oh, I thought you had a question. Does anybody have a question? I thought I saw a hand up. No? Okay. All right, so let's talk about it. So the first basic question is do, can MPAs, can protected areas work? Okay, and, and in particular, this, was a, this has been a big controversy. On land, we know that when we put up Yellowstone, we now have a ton of bison. Now our bison, now the problem is the bison have filled up the carrying capacity of that, of that part of Yellowstone. And for example, this last winter, they have left the, the park boundaries and they don't have the same level of protections outside, American bison, outside of the park. And so a lot of them were shot. It was a big controversy and all this kind of stuff, right? So, but the point is, but, but the fact that we had a protected area allowed us to restore that, that herd there. So we have lots of evidence that protection, protected areas on land can help. The question is, does that work in the ocean when we have these, what do we call them, the life history stage? Bipartite, two-parted, the two-parted life history stage. So, so, so just like it's hard for us to predict, right? We could all, it could also be the case that this place is a death zone for fish, right? Or whatever. But because the input is coming from outside, it's like, what, dude? We're fishing a gazillion million fish a year and we still get more fish. It's all good. The ocean is limitless, right? So that can be misleading in a bunch of different ways, right? So it's a more complicated test when we're testing protected areas for open populations relative to a closed geographically well-defined uh, population. Cool? Okay. So let's see. So therefore, let's, look, let's see if we have any evidence that the marine protected areas can actually help us with, let's say, some fish stocks. So here's some data. Let me orient you to this. This is biomass. This is a common way we measure harvested organisms in the ocean. So it's not 145 fish, it's you weigh them and you talk about the, the total you know, mass that we take out. So that's biomass. Uh, this next one is density. This is the number of individuals per unit area. This one is size. This is uh, generally how, how big in the longest dimension. So with fish, it would be snout to tail or what we call standard, standard length. And then diversity is typically, I mean, it could be whatever, but I believe in this one, it's mostly species richness, okay? And then over here on this axis, this is relative change. This is relative change from either before the, the protected area was established, which is the ideal thing, or maybe we established it and then measured it very early on. So regardless, it's, it's from, from uh, back in the day to some current time point, cool? And this data is compiling data from fish and invertebrates and macroalgae from 124 different marine protected areas. And the black dots are all the individual points from all the 124 different, uh, different places. And so in some cases, they're, they're so on top of each other, you can't see the distinct point. And then they're averaged uh, uh, there. And, and the percentage is the average change uh, in, in there. So now, there, the, note there are no error bars here, but we have the raw data so you can get a, a general sense of the distribution of the data, okay? So um, this is telling us that in terms of biomass, when we establish a marine protected area, um, it, it, no matter what it started with, so some of them have small biomass to start with, some have medium biomass, some have large, Whatever we started with, on average, we're about four timesing that, or more than four timesing that um, biomass. It is true that we do have some uh, MPAs that didn't work. We have some MPAs that over time, there's less and less and less fish, or, or, or fewer and fewer uh, individuals, or smaller and smaller individuals. So we're not saying this works every single time, all over the place, 100%. But on average, it's, it's, and also note that um, it doesn't look like a normal distribution. Everybody with me on this? We don't have a few dots here and a few dots here and then a bunch of dots in the middle. There's a clustering around, and I should, oh, also let me know, this is an axis break, 
right? So this is not a continuous linear scale. It goes into 15, then it jumps up to 1,000, right? So I'll just note that when we jump up to 1,000, there's a clustering up there, which is really big biomass added, like a lot more things, like a gazillion more things in the water. Um, uh, and then there's also one, uh, there's a lot of clustering around 100%. A lot of clustering around, not so changed, yeah? So again, there's heterogeneity in terms of the, uh, the uh, what's produced uh, by these things, in terms of biomass. Then we can talk about density. Generally speaking, I'd say the same pattern, although it's less intense. So the density is about a, hundred, a bit more than one and a half times the, the starting um, uh, level. In terms of size, not so much. In terms of size, um, it's only about a third, on average, the critters are only about a third bigger than they were before we established. And then in terms of diversity, only about a fifth uh, uh, more diverse. And so this is not surprising. So the very first thing, biomass, what's that? That's how, that's how heavy I am, right? And so if, if, if the conditions are better for me, I'm probably going to be eating more. That's going to be the, you know, if we suddenly go to In-N-Out and just eat In-N-Out all day long today, tomorrow, the next couple weeks, my weight is going to change first, right? That's going to be the first thing that's changed. I'm not going to have more kids. I'm not going to, you know, do all that. I'm going to gain physiologically add on more biomass to my individual, right? And so that makes sense. Density is the next one. And so this, this follows a logical pattern. Um, but I would say still the important thing is on average, these are all positive, even though some are larger than others. Yeah. Uh, oh, great question. Uh, and I specifically did not tell you that. It is variable. So some of these are a long, as this, this is just using the literature. So this is people going and doing, it, like reading a bunch of papers and then putting it down. So in some cases, it's a few years. In some cases, it's 20 years or 30 years. Or like yes. Like yes. Sure. But the first question is, does this have the potential to work? So this says that at least theoretically, this seems to be helping, right? Or, or, or let me say a different way. Theoretically, this can help. This can help the, the critters we're talking about. Good. Okay. Um, uh, so do we have, uh, let's look at some other examples. So here's a, a, what's I think now considered a classic example from our own backyard. This is from Anacapa Island. And um, what we're talking about here is a relatively small reserve area. Um, and, and, and I had you guys read the, the Channel Islands uh, Marine Protected Area paper. Uh, this, is, this is the data that helped justify doing the, the Channel Islands networks. This is from, so this, this was established, we're talking about data here from before we had the big network. So this was sort of like, almost like a one-off kind of thing, this little area off of our side of Anacapa. Okay, and so, so here we go. So, so we're talking about, um, so, yeah, I should, probably should have given you guys the, the basic, uh, I need to give you guys a basic kelp lecture, but um, anyway, uh, so the basic idea here is kelp, macrocystis, giant kelp, big, highly productive uh, marine alga, grows, 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 drives a massive ecosystem based on detritus, based on sloughed off tissue and that those pieces, oh, so one, just physically the structure of the kelp bed changes water flow, changes light, makes places for critters to hide, all that kind of stuff. So physically it interacts with the environment and makes um, it possible to have more diverse communities, et cetera. But then also it itself produces, you know, fixes carbon and that detrital food web is also really important for many of the critters that live on and or around kelp beds. So one of those critters, uh, it, or, yeah, one group of those critters are our, our urchins. So these echinoderms that are normally going to spend their life, uh, that if they're out and open, sheephead, all these other fish are going to munch on them and kill them. So generally speaking, their default condition is to hide from daytime predators. So they'll be in cracks and nooks and crannies in the daytime, and then they only maybe come out a little bit at night when the you know, when the sun's down to feed. They will feed on uh, algae. 
And so in a healthy system, we have a lot of kelp. That kelp frond is going to slough off and it's going to drift around and some of it's going to drift into the little crack and the urchin is going to catch it and going to eat it. Okay. Um, another thing we have here are our uh, lobster community. So the lobsters also, uh, you sometimes see them out in the daytime too, but mostly again, they're going to be hiding in cracks at, at, uh, at night because predators will love to eat them and all that kind of good stuff. And they will uh, sort of come out and about at night. Um, what we found, uh, okay, and so what we're, what we're talking about here is talking about the reserve or the MPA. So the green here is the MPA and the, the purple or blue colored here, teal colored, is um, uh, the area that is outside the marine protected area where people could fish the way they, you know, following state law and all this kind of stuff, but still they could fish at, at their uh, leisure, at their interest. Is that just residential or is that commercial? Uh, both. So the question is, is this, is this like recreational and, uh, you know, commercial harvesting? It's, it's everybody. So, so anybody could be, uh, for the purpose of this figure, anybody in the teal any area, anybody could, is a free for all kind of thing. Okay. So uh, the other thing just to explain is, well, uh, yeah, no, let me just show this. Okay. So here we go. So starting in 1982, um, uh, let's see what's, uh, let's see what's going on here. So if we talk about, um, Okay, so so let me also say that uh, the the normal con the normal the um, the default condition, the most common condition, is we have a lot of kelp, not that many urchins. I mean, some urchins we definitely have urchins; they're, they're part of it, but but they're, but they're not like everywhere we look. And then we have lobsters. Uh, the, uh, if, so who eats uni at the, if, if you guys go to sushi or whatever, who, who eats, who's tried uni? Likes uni. Okay. So what you're eating is, the, are the gonads of these, of these critters. And be, and so essentially they are classic, the urchins are classic broadcast spawners. So they're classic open population critters. And so in an ideal world, like, like the best possible life for an urchin is to be in a crack next to a big, huge, giant kelp individual and just sit there the whole life and just eat, and just eat. like barely move and just eat all day. Like they'd be, they love it if that's the whole life, right? Um, what urchins illustrate and many other of our critters also embody is you're all good. I get strong. Once I get strong and I flow energy to my somatic physiology, my, my living physiology, then once I max that out, then I put energy into my reproductive system, right? And then I, then I have offspring. When I'm stressed energetically or because of a disaster or something like that, the first thing many, many animals do is shunt the energy to away from the reproduction. So the idea is that, oh my God, I better put energy into my somatic stuff, my physiology, my, my, my living day to day because otherwise I'm gonna die. And so the, the interpretation in an evolutionary context is that, oh yeah, I'm not gonna have any babies this year, but then I'll live, and then in a future year I can have babies, right? So that from the, from the evolutionary standpoint, that's more successful to do that approach. So what'll happen when we have a bad condition, classically that was El Nino. El Nino brings in warm water, the warm water nukes is bad for the kelp, and the kelp population goes down and there's less, less individuals, fewer individuals, they're producing less biomass, all that kind of stuff. So then all of a sudden that, that urchin that was down in his or her crack and just hanging out, all of a sudden now there's no more food floating into me. And I'm like, what? So the first thing they'll do is they'll reabsorb their gonads. So they'll absorb all that energy. And then once that's done, then they start to starve. And then they enter a phase that we refer to as an urchin barren. And so what's gonna happen there is now they're like, they're normally not in the daytime. Now they're like, screw it, I'm dead, right? So they emerge from their cracks and they just are ravenous. They're, star they're literally starving to death. So they're just gonna mow down whatever the hell's in front of them. So, so they're, and, and again, as a reminder, their mouth parts are on the bottom. So they're gonna walk along the bottom and just, you know, crunch along, crunch along, crunch along. And so they'll eat things, but they'll also rub things off. So even if there's a, 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 a attached 
hold fast of a kelp, they either will munch it to death or they'll just start bumping up against it and they'll like, you know, essentially clear cut, uh, just like a clear cut in a the forest, they'll clear cut the, the reef. And so that's an indication of a stress system. So when you go to sushi and you eat, and you eat uni, that's coming from an he a healthy individual, a healthy population that has relatively large gonads, which is what you guys are eating. Okay, so what we see here is we, we do have periods of up and down. Okay, so going from, 80 to, in this case, 82 to the early 2000s. We do have periods of, um, of up and down in terms of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, kelp, right? But it, but it works for all these things, right? But in terms of, in terms of um, kelp, we have some periods where we have high levels, some periods low levels. Why? Because the world is happening everywhere. El Nino's stressful conditions are happening. But even with that variation, even with that annual variation, what we see is on average, the marine reserve always had a better response than the fished area, right? And so what was basically going on is, we think, um, in the, fished, in the fished area, we took out a lot of the lobsters. One of the things lobsters will eat are urchins, especially small baby urchins. So we've not, and I should say, there's all, historically there's also sea otters. We, we've eliminated them from the population. Sea otters would also eat urchins. They love to eat urchins. So we've eliminated these big predators. So in the fished areas, in this case, people I mean, now people fish for urchins, but, but this wasn't about an urchin fishery. This was a lobster fishery, but that lobster fishery is impacting the kelp. And so in the fish area, we knock down the predators. And so when the, when the urchins, when, the, when it's a sort of bad time, the urchins just go crazy. There's nothing to control them. And so we have com comparatively not that much kelp in areas Again, same ocean, same island, same, you know, Channel Islands area. Um, here, the only difference is we didn't nuke all of the predators. So because we didn't nuke all the predators, even though, yes, some years it was up, some years it was down, on average, these lobsters were able to control the urchins and not let them ever, I mean, there's more some years than others, but they never got out of control. And because they never got out of control, we always have relatively more kelp. And in the case of kelp, because kelp is a foundational species, is a, is a keystone species for this ecosystem, that means we have all these other things that are, you know, that are unrelated to lobster. We have more fish hiding in the fronds, and we have more other critters, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So from, our, from Anacapa, we have some area, I mean, some ideas. When we dis Increasingly now we've realized that we can't just, so back in the day, Anna Kappa was, let's do a reserve, right? Of that example from Catalina, let's do a reserve. Why? Usually it was very, very idiosyncratic reasons. So the Wrigley Reserve that I mentioned that was very small, 0.15 kilometers out on Catalina, that's because that's where researchers like me worked. And we didn't want people to F up our experiments. So one of the most angry times it ever was, so my PhD, I did a bunch, I did a bunch of things. One of the things I did was put these tiles out underwater, uh, uh, ceramic tiles, and looked at how things recruited onto them. And what the most I, most I ever lost it on somebody uh, was, um, it was always 4th of July, because everybody's always drunk as hell, and they're like driving boats around. And so it's in a little teeny cove, like maybe like the size of like two or three Sierra Halls, underneath a big giant sign about the size of that wall that says no anchoring marine protected area and again my experiment is is terracotta it's 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 clay right it's 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 uh, easily broken um and i had this whole network that covered about like one whole floor of sierra hall it's always my dive assistants were like god this is an impossible project um anyway um and so we just finished a dive we get back on the boat, and I see this super uh, overweight gentleman with a beer in his hand, and like, and like, you know, it's a big powerboat cigarette, kind of like Miami Vice, kind of about, and then he's like, here, and then his like teenage kid, like I see, grab an anchor and start to walk to the. I'm like, no, 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 and the guy's like, what? And he throws his anchor into the water and it sinks down and, and then I, and I was like, then I, anyway, bad things happen. But, um, but the point is that, that, marine, that marine reserve was for people like me, right? So idiosyncratic, hey, I will, 
me and other academics want to do research, don't drop your anchor here, right? That's how most of our historic protected areas uh, were established. Now, we have some evidence that, oh my gosh, these marine protected areas kind of work, right? But we can't just have the Catalina thing, or like we, this needs to be more robust, right? Overfishing, biodiversity crises, this kind of stuff, we need a larger thing. So now we, more and more, the norm is to talk about a network. So not one area, but a, but a, a group of linked areas, okay? So let's talk about some of the things that we want to consider conceptually if we were to establish a marine protected area. Now, these things also apply to terrestrial, to all protected areas, but we're just sticking with the example here of marine protected areas. Um, but but th these, are, these are kind of these are universal concepts, I would say. So the first one, um, we'll talk about the component and then the criteria. The component would be where it's physically located on the map, so the location, the Latin lawn. Next is how big is the thing, okay? Third, since we're talking about a network now, is how much space is in between me and you, or, or site number one and site number two and site number three, okay? So how is it spaced in, in, in the real world? How far apart are they? And then another key, import, key aspect is enforcement. So when we put this in and we have a, have a network how do we not have the Yahoo drunk guy buzz on in and throw an anchor on top of, or just go fishing or, or do whatever, have the impact to our area, okay? So the criteria we're gonna use for these things is for location, generally speaking, when we're trying to figure out where should we put a marine protected area, we're gonna usually use representation. So I'm worried about a kelp reef and I'm worried about um, a seagrass bed, and I'm worried about whatever. So let's, if we find an area, let's make sure they have those, they have those things, either in every single uh, chunk, or in our network, at least somewhere, there's at least some seagrass protected. There's at least some kelp forest protected, right? So representation matters. Two, size, how big do we make it, right? And so do we want it to be the size of our classroom? Do we want it to be the size of campus? Do we want it to be the size of the county? Like what's the right, what's the right answer, right? And of course, you know, we would always say, oh, as big as possible, right? Big as possible. But, but there are real world constraints on that, right? So there's always pushback, there's always trade-offs. And so size is generally gonna be driven by our focal organisms and how those focal organisms move around. So some fish, let's say, let's we'll just take the example of fish, because fish is usually what we use, because fish are the kind of most, most uh, exploited, conspicuously exploited thing and all that, isn't that? But the idea applies to barnacles and everything else. But so the idea is, hey, maybe, so some of our fish are gonna hang out in the table area where, of your guy's desk. So that would be the, that, that's how much a average individual moves, right? Uh, maybe some other, Organisms are going to move around the size of Sierra Hall. Maybe some others are going to move around this side of the campus and et cetera. So we would need to understand roughly how much do our dudes move. Why? Because I don't want to establish a protected area where let's say someone can't fish, but if my individual is likely to move outside of that once a day, that's probably not going to work, right? Because as soon as he or she goes outside, they're potentially going to be vulnerable to exploitation. So we want it to be big enough to cover a size, big enough to cover the typical adult movement, okay? Or, or, the, or the mobile life history stage uh, uh, of them. Okay, so that's for the adult half of the bipartite life history uh, story. For the dispersive life history stage, that comes into place in the spacing. How far apart do we put these do we put these things, right? And so the, with the idea there being, okay, so you guys, you guys here, you're in the protected area, you're cool. Nobody's fishing you, you're making babies, all that good stuff. How far are your larvae, how far are your, is your dispersive life history stage gonna go? So if your, life, if your dispersive life history stage is only gonna go a meter, ugh, we probably just, that's probably not gonna work, right? But if, you're, but if your life history stage is gonna, means you're gonna float in the water column for on average a week, before you metamorphose and become a sedentary version of yourself, right? We could say, okay, so let's measure the average current movement. Okay, cool. 
and then we're going to say, okay, so if we put a, a protected area, and let's, maybe, let's make a number, let's make that like 50 kilometers, right? So if we put another one 50 kilometers away, we could have a connectivity, right? We could have genetic connection. We could have some, some you know, sharing of propagules, you know, that kind of thing. So the size driven by the adult uh, natural history, the spacing driven by the dispersal phase of the critters. And then, um, and then we have enforcement. So enforcement is going to want to have us have very small, very tight uh, networks and or just one. Instead of three medium-sized ones, just one big one, right? Because logistically, it's easier to defend small spaces. It's easier to defend one space rather than lots of things, you know, just all over the place, right? Administratively, just, you know, purely how do you get there in a boat? It's, it's all those things are much more uh, complicated. And so uh, what we need for the enforcement side, we need clearly delineated areas clearly delineated activities that people can and cannot do. And this will come up, we're not getting this to today, but when we talk about our California State Marine Protected Area Network, this was a huge part of the, the reason why we needed to create it. We had 37 different types of marine protected areas, right? So some of them you could like collect snails, but nothing else. Some of them you could recreational fish, but not, and it was just a nightmare. Like no, it, even folks who are trying to be responsible, like, what can I do? And, you know, unclear. So clear delineation in space, clear delineation of what is, is you know, legally allowed to happen and not happen. And then lastly, really importantly, in terms of the enforcement, is there needs to be the resources available. We would, or oftentimes we default to talk about money, and money is the key part of that, but, but it's also time, and do we have the people power to do it, and that kind of stuff. Okay, um, yeah, okay, so one other, I just have a note here. So, so a marine protected area, we have not gone through the categories yet, but marine protected area, as I meant, or any protected area, as I mentioned, is a potentially a range of types of protection, of degrees of protection, we could think of it as. Um, and I'll just say that um, when it comes to MPA, we usually talk about a partial or complete closure to fishing. Fishing is the most common thing that people want to regulate with MPAs. And the, the complete fisher, fishing, you know, close to fishery, fishing at all, except for scientific monitoring to, to go like, like check the fish out. Um, those are also called no-take areas or no-take reserves. Most of our best data come from the no-take reserves, even though theoretically we're talking about all protected areas. It's just the pattern is clearer. It's, it gets a little mucky when you say like, you know, the clearest comparison is between fish as much as you want and no fishing at all versus fishing a little bit. It's just a little bit harder to interpret. Okay? Questions so far about the stuff I'm talking about? Actually. Salmon, for example. Mm -hmm. like yeah, so, so Ashley's question is, hey, so uh, we're talking about adult, DLO, dispersive, you know, life history phase. How does that work with like anadromous species that start out let's say in the freshwater, and then they're out at sea for a long time, say as adults, but then the reproduction is happening up in streams, much more complicated. There's a reason why our steelhead is massively endangered, right? There's a reason why most of our salmon stocks are crashing. And that's because it, it's, it's a lot harder to do. Uh, so let's, let's hold that for a future conversation, but I'll just note, I'll just say that um, one of the biggest problems of habitat fragmentation, riparian fragmentation is a huge part of that story, which is typically controlled by a different agency. Army Corps of Engineers, farmers want water, and you'll see all throughout the, you know, right now you'll see all throughout the, um, if you drive the five or whatever, uh, food grows where water flows. Therefore, water is what we need. End of story. Don't tell, don't tell me about the Delta smelt. Don't tell me about the salmon because we're growing food for you, right? So it, it, it gets into that level of debate, right? So it, we get removed from just talking about the most optimal protected area and it gets into other social competing things. Um, but the other one I will say though, just to finish putting a temporary tack on that is um, uh, the stuff we're talking about here, the MPA 
you know, creating a network, it's usually one entity. It's the Park Service. It's uh, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's the state of California or whatever. In the case of salmon, we have very different, so, so um, the entity that's gonna regulate most of our fisheries, the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, sometimes regulates the salmonid population, sometimes it's a state agency. And so, so it, it, gets, it just gets really complicated in terms of bureaucratically, administratively, who's in charge of that resource. And indeed, because sometimes, because like the state doesn't regulate like a gyre out in the middle of the Pacific, right? And vice versa. So it, it's a, the anadromous fish really show the weakness of, our, of some of our policy structures, is what I'd say. Okay. Okay, so here's some questions uh, that will uh, probably, this will probably take us to the end of today. Um, and we'll just pause here. Um, but I'll say, uh, uh, or the answers answer to these will probably take us today. We probably won't get past this. Um, but here are some, some current MPA questions. And I would say these questions have been around for a couple decades now. So th these are, we're, we're constantly working on these. We don't, we don't have a perfect answer to all of these in all situations now. So the first one is, are prote percent protection targets useful? You guys have all read at least a little bit about the 30 by 30. Um, a plan. We'll talk more about that later, um, which is one of, it's our California version of the federal version of the UN version. Um, but it's essentially percent protection targets with the idea, I, just, I started this, uh, or earlier in this presentation, I showed you, hey, 16% terrestrial, 8% marine, right? That's what we're talking about. What percentage of the total area uh, should we be shooting for? Should we have half of our area in a protected um, in some form of protection? Should we have 10% of our area in terms of protection, what have you? Next, how large should any one reserve be, right? Um, uh, right now, we're in the process of adding the Chumash uh, National Marine Heritage Sanctuary between Monterey and Channel Islands, making a contiguous thing. And most conservation folks, enviro folks, like, yay, yo. Uh, however, I would, and I'm not, I'm not, I've, to be totally, for, you know, lay cards on the table, I've written letters of support for that, but, but, but setting that aside, um, if, if we just say, you can't fish anywhere, you can't log anywhere, end of story, that's great for the trees, that's not good for the communities, right? So, the goal of marine protected areas is not to shut down all these human activities, it's to do them sustainably, right? And responsibly. So, so just having one giant reserve that covers all of California might sound simple, but then what are the fisher, how, how are the fishing folks gonna make a living, right? So, so there's, there's a question as to how large should any one single reserve be that gets that conservation benefit, but you know, isn't the whole state, right? Kind of thing, okay. Number three is um, how much and, and, and what species do well outside of the boundaries of the marine protected area. Again, the goal is, is not just to, to make sure, I mean, first and foremost, we want to make sure this, say, a species doesn't go extinct. So we want that critter to be around. But then also we want there to be benefit for the folks that are exploiting the resource, want to, want to do this sustainably. So we do want there to be, generally speaking, some leak, right? We do want there to be some, some fish that go outside that other people can fish, so that we can eat fish and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then a very common question, because most of our areas around the world, terrestrial or marine, have some existing, have an existing number and location and size of protected area units, can we use that as the ba basis of a, of a, of a better network? Or should we just throw everything out, baby out with the bath water and start over from the beginning? So these are, these are some key questions. Everybody cool? Okay. So um, how do we answer this? We answer these in two ways. Ideally, the best is always empirical data. As you and I go slap on a, a scuba tank and we go count some things. Or we go out with the fishermen and we drag some nets and we see how many fish, what's the composition in this area. So empirical data is always going to be the best. Um, and, uh, and we have some experience with that, with, with, with the existing network of, of things and historic data. 
The problem is, historically, we've had very few um, experimental tests of this. So we have like patterns over time, but we don't have a place where you and I put in a marine protected area now and let it go for 10 years and see what happens and then remove that protected area and see what happens, right? We don't, we don't really do manipulative experiments in, in most protected area contexts. Yes, we do. Yeah, so the question is, don't we have these things that have been around for a while? Yes, we do. Totally. Yeah. But again, that Anna Kappa example I told you about? Yeah. The reserve wasn't some random spot. No. This wasn't some random spot, right? This was picked because it was a good place for kelp. So how do we disassociate the just inherently good place for kelp versus now adding on the changed exploitation level. I mean, it's possible, it, it, and, it, and we people do this, but but it's not as clean. It's not as clean as if. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's what we do. That's what we do for like drugs and things, right? So we want to say, hey, does this drug affect this disease, right? Yeah. And we're like, hey, let me give you this. I'm going to give some people a placebo and give some people the drug and we, do, we experimentally test it, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'll just say that in a practical sense, it's hard to do manipulative experiments in a protected area context, oh, especially yeah. marine one. So, so I, you know, acknowledging that's the best data, if we can, that, that's the best way to test it, but it's just hard. So as a consequence, oftentimes we're using models, particularly when we're talking about designing a protected area network, right? So for those, we're doing what if questions. So what, what if we were to have one that was five meters wide? What if we were to have one that was 50 meters wide? You know, and, and, we, and we, a lot of people have spent their careers trying to figure out how we best model these things. Um, historically, these models, and models are only as good as the assumptions that go into them, and only as good as the, 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 the priming data that goes into them, right? And so historically, we didn't have good data. Now, as things are getting better in the last decade or two, we're getting, they're getting better. But historically, they were not really well done. And I would say that the models are usually very, very conservative. Very, very conservative. OK? All right. So let's talk a little bit about per percent protection targets. So we said one of the things is, what should, our, what should the target be? Should it be 10%? Should it be 50%? Should it be 90%? What should the goal be? Um, okay, so I forget, did I just have one slide on this? Yeah, okay. So, all right, so here we go. So, um, I'll just say that the majority of our historic percent protection targets are a political construct, okay? That's not to say they're bad, but they're, they're not based on 100 years of high robust modeling and then say, how are we gonna get this guy to persist? We're gonna need like 17.1%, no. It is informed by science, informed by experience, also in, oftentimes informed by crisis, and then crafted by policy folks, usually. What do I mean by that? I mean, I mean someone who's trying to get it passed. Right, in, in the in the state, in the legislature, in the tribe, in the community, whatever, wherever we're talking about. So in 1992, the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is a, um, a, a, a it's not the UN, but it's 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 facilitated by the UN. It's an independent body. It's kind of like the IPCC, which is sort of related, but it's it's also you know distinct. Um, so the IUCN does a lot of global conservation stuff. So I'm part of the transboundary working group, and some people are on the endangered species group, and all these different things. So um, in any event, uh, the IUCN suggested that we should have the goal should be uh, planet wide. We should protect 10% of all of our ecosystems in some form of rigorous protected area. Um, the next, and, it was, it was, and so this was with the Rio Summit, this was the Convention on Biological Diversity and all this and that, which our country still is not ratified. Um, one of the only countries on the planet that hasn't, because um, we have a very strong biotech 
industry that wants to patent the world and make money on genes across the world. Um, but uh, in 1997, we get, in 1987, we get our first real, um, I would say, I mean, the, the, the 1992 target, that was real. I don't mean that was fake. But I think the one that really, I would say, sort of took off more in the public imagination was uh, this uh, 20 by 20 plan. And so this, and this was endorsed by the American Academy of Sciences. So scientists, right? And uh, they said, hey, we, sh and this is in the specific context of MPAs, we should have 20% of the world's oceans, not in any flavor of protected area, but in a no take, so no fishing at all. Not sustainable fishing, not commercial fishing, not nothing. So 20% of the surface area of the ocean should be in a no-take reserve by 2020. Where did that come from? I didn't, I, it took me the longest time to figure out where this came from. Could not figure it out. And then I was in a bar one night after a meeting and was talking to this guy from Florida. So he was a, a fisheries biologist from the state of, uh, from the state of uh, Florida and he was one of the key drivers in this. So he happened to work on the Space Coast. So he happened to work where Cape Canaveral is, right? And so, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of our early protected areas, they were by, you know, um, haphazard, right? Like, oh, it's where the researchers want to do their work, whatever. So it turns out when we shoot rocket ships up into space, crap goes bad sometimes, right? We, uh, Elon Musk, when he tried to launch his spaceship on it, blew up. The first one blew up, and there's chunks of steel falling like two miles away, right? Um, so these can be dangerous things, right? So when we do a launch of, you know, the Atlas V rocket going to the moon or whatever, it was like everybody clear the hell out, right? The people controlling it are in a bunker, in a, in a literal concrete bunker like a mile away, right? Um, so it turns out when that would happen, they would clear everybody, not just the people out in the, out in the, on the highway and stuff, but people that were in the nearshore waters. And so in effect, Cape Canaveral became for most of the year a, an M, what we would now call an MPA. People could not fish there for, for purely space, you know, unrelated to biological stuff. And so this guy who was a state fisheries biologist started noticing, oh my God, the largest landings, like the record red drum and all these fish they would catch, they were all from this area of Florida. Like he's like, what's going on? And he's, they're trying to figure out something. He's like, oh my gosh, this is a place where people don't routinely fish. And so what was happening is the fish were having a reserve and they're getting big and, and the big guys were either coming outside the reserve or they were making lots of babies and those babies were doing well. And so he started looking at the percent, like, like how the fish grew and everything. And, and long story short, that ended up getting us to, um, he, felt we needed a, a significant chunk of the coastal waters in a form of protection. And this was the late, this was the mid 90s, right? And so he knew that in Florida, it would be a bit of a hard sell to get people to do some of this protection stuff, right? And so he was trying to figure out a way to make it make sense. And, and as he told me over libations, like it was like thinking maybe 50%. And he was like, no way. Never in a million years am I going to say half the ocean you're not going to be able to fish in, right? So that won't work. 10%, that doesn't sound right. And so long story short, how we got the 20 by 20, now the science that goes in behind this, but, but why the specific 20% exactly was when this was released in the late 90s, the idea was let's have a good target, but it'll take a while to get there. What's, what, is 10 years too far? Man, nah, 10 years seems pretty aggressive. What about 20 years? Yeah, 30 years, 30, we probably do, need to do it before 30. So 20, so 20, gut check, nothing magical. 20 seemed to be kind of soon, but not too soon. And then when they're, when they're doing the modeling, they're like, well, is it 18% or is it 22%? They're like, hey man, let's keep it simple. Let's make it 20% 20 by 2020. Sound good. So that's how we got that percent protection target. Okay, so this is talking about, this is talking about just the, 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 the two-dimensional extent. Okay. So not the volume, but this is just of the, like if we delineate it on a map and we're looking at the area on a map, that's what we're talking about. 
So the, so the area of the surface water, you could say. Okay. All right. Uh, then, um, and so, you know, so that got a lot of press and a lot of stuff. But then, but then people like us, the scientists, started saying, like, dude, where'd you get 20%? I'm like, where'd that come from? Right? And so people started doing more rigorous modeling and things. And so then we start to get a refined, some, some refining of this. And so the next one comes out in the early 2000s where people are saying, hey, it's, it's got to be uh, like 20 to 30 percent, right? Some, some models show closer to 30, some show like maybe 20 is okay. And so, so they expanded it a bit. Uh, we have uh, then the Convention on Biodiversity uh, uh, met in Aachi, Japan. And uh, in 2010, they um, uh, uh, gave, uh, re reinforced the 10% um, uh, of marine and coastal areas, but they upped the terrestrial protection targets to 17%. Um, and I'll just say that there, there's all kinds of stuff. And I'll, I'll just want to don't write these down, but I just want to say these are different examples of studies, especially in the early days when we were first trying to figure out what the percent protection target should be. And this is some of the range, right? And these are all from modeling results. And so note, some of them are talking about 5%, some of them are talking about 15%, some are talking about 80%. Uh, the key, did I talk about this next? I can't remember. Okay. Um, so the key thing here is going to be um, that we're not starting, uh, kind of like what Ashley was saying before, we're not starting from the same page, right? Some of these fisheries are kind of screwed. Some of them are, oh my God, they're going extinct, right? So there's a mix of things. So that's, that's the main driver in these models is to how come it says 30%? How come it says 15%? If we look more closely, 15% is for overfished red urchin populations, mostly in Northern California. If we look at heavily overfished Caribbean reef fish species, it's going to be more like 70 to 80 percent, right? So it's going to depend on, on the state of the resource that we're, um, that we're coming to at this point in time. Uh, some, and this is a bit, this is a couple years old now. I haven't done this before, since before COVID, but, but it's, it, the main takeaway I think is still valid, which is um, if we, if we, summarize a lot of these modeling studies that have been done in the last couple decades, we get something like on the order of um, about a third of the surface area is necessary to both stabilize biodiversity and grow commercially exploited fish species. So about, about a third, right? So is it exactly 33.7? That's what the numbers came out, but the point is it's, it's a third seems to be fairly well supported and defensible. Um, we could put, we could maybe do okay even if we were a bit lower than that target, if we're like on the order of like one fifth to one third, right? Because again, as I mentioned before, these modeling efforts are, are tend to be fairly conservative. What is very clear, 100% of all the modeling shows, um, the more overexploited, the more tweaked, the more um, depopulated uh, or, or um, uh, less diverse the community is or the fewer individuals, if we're talking about a, a population, then the more area we have to have to get it recovered. And the reality is, despite what that stuff says about 8% in an MPA of no-take MPAs, it's less than a percentage of our US waters. And our US has very strong enforcement compared to most of the planet. So the vast majority of our MPAs and therefore the vast majority of the ocean is not in an MPA, is not in a no-take MPA. Uh, let's look at what this, let's look at what this means. Uh, or let's look about this in terms of size. So here's a very practical thing where we'll be going in a, or some of this we'll be going to in a, in a few weeks. How big should it, so, that, so that, the first question was percent protection targets. Next question, how big should any one particular reserve be? And I've not defined these areas for you yet, but these are two different flavors of our current version of our MPA network in California. Um, and the size is going to depend on our driving goal. Um, in general, there's two broad categories that, that we tend to use in terms of going to make these decisions. One, do we want a more, do we want to boost biodiversity? or I should say, not boost, 
ideally that everything gets helped, but do we want to focus on optimizing biodiversity? Let me say it that way. Or do we want to focus on optimizing fish, uh, uh, available commercially exploited fish uh, abundances? Okay, so biodiversity, fish, okay. So here, here are these two areas along the central coast of California, and the colors just rec represent a slightly different category, but, but the, the inside, the red or the blue, is a, is a protected area. Okay, so for biodiversity, what we wanna have is we wanna have a bigger, on average, MPA unit, right? Why? Because we wanna boost it, and we have different critters, right? We have different, we have maybe some, some snails and we have some coral and we have some algae. We have, so, right, so we want to have it be big, big enough that we have self-recruitment or auto-recruitment. So when my, my reproducing coral reproduces, those babies, you know, kind of stay in and I want to sort of capture that output as much as I can, if I can, right? So that's for the biodiversity goals. If instead our goal is to maximize fishery productivity, we're gonna to wanna to, on average probably do a slightly, or not slightly, but a smaller area. Why? Because we wanna maximize spillover, right? We want it to be large enough that we can stabilize that population, but we don't want it to be so big that we, uncover, we you know, cover the entirety, 100% of the fish all the time, right? So we want some of the babies, some of the juveniles that are looking for new territory or whatever it is to disperse out and so-called spill over or go outside of the protection boundary, spill over the wall, and then they're available for recreational or commercial uh, uh, harvest. Cool? Okay, and so here's some examples of how you go about figuring that out. So, so uh, here is, um, so this is the, the, the color, on this left graph here. So these are, this is fish movement um, study where we go and we put a, a, a tracker on a fish and then we, uh, historically we listen to it beep, 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 beep with a, with a transmitter, a radio transmitter. Um, increasingly now we have these autonomous things that do this just all the time underwater, but regardless of how we did it, we have a, a locator device on the fish and then we're, we're logging where that fish is moving through time and space. Sometimes we have additional things like water temperatures, but, but that's what we do. Okay, and here's some examples of from Kenya, from Alaska, and from Florida. And, different, and there are different fish species in those respective places. Um, this is the maximum distance traveled uh, from the reserve. So we've, we've tagged these individuals inside the MPA, and then we're following them, and let's see how far they go. And so we have some things like this snapper that are going less than a less than a mile. This is in miles because this is this, this old presentation. But um, but you know, tied in, they don't go very far. They're pretty much attached. They're they're very close to the that area. Then we have other things like the snook in Florida that's going very far, right? It's going up to, you know, it's going down to Orange County if it were if we were here, right? And like that kind of scale of movement. Um, uh, we can also, so, so that's one way. So one way to get a sense of, of movement is to tag the actual individuals and follow them. That works well for big fish. Uh, that's harder for things like small seaweeds and little snails. Like how am I gonna monitor them? So for those other critters, we typically use a genetic approach, right? So we look to see these markers, some unique genetic markers of this population. And then we look to see how far away do we see those markers. Are those markers only in this one spot? Are they ubiquitous across this region, meaning there's genetic mixing and just, you know, movement that way, connectivity and all that kind of stuff. And what we see is uh, with seaweeds, uh, on, on average, we're talking on the order of, you know, a mile-ish or so, something like that. When we talk about, and I should note that this scale is logarithmic, right? It's not, not linear. So, um, so the algae tend to move not that much on average. The fish tend to move on average a long ways, and the invertebrates are kind of in between the two. Okay, so we can take tra uh, uh, actual individual movement data to look at this. We can also look at uh, population genetic data to look at this. And so, um, so from the literature, uh, again, how big it should be is gonna, uh, uh, so Ben's paper, 
from God. I'm old. That's 20 years ago now. Man, I feel very old. Um, uh, anyway, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend uh, on a few things, but in general, recommended about 10 to 20 square kilometers for, for reserves, kind of like in our part of the world type of thing. For individuals that are really wide ranging, let's say sea turtles, right? Green sea turtles or something like that. It's, it's un, like they, they couldn't figure that one out. So, so for more common reef dwelling species on the order of 10 to 20 square kilometers. Uh, the next one of these is this uh, ma major, major group from UC Davis that does a lot of this modeling. It was really, really historically been very um, important to our, our thinking about this. Their answer is as many, so if the, if the goal is conservation, if the goal is conservation, so biodiversity, uh, as big as we can possibly get them to be. If instead the goal is fisheries, we should have many, many fewer and smaller and many more of them. So we should have like salt, like salted around the, the state basically kind of thing. Uh, and then the group from UCSB uh, was saying that um, in general, we really need a network. So whatever, whatever the answer is, we, we want multiple units is gonna be better. Um, and that is especially true when we have strong dis dispersal, dispersion, primarily through strong currents. Um, so okay, so we have so we have on the order of ten to twenty square kilometers seems to be sort of common for our types of parts of the world. Uh, if it's if it's conservation target, we want it, you know, Higante. If it's a fisheries one, we want it smaller. And regardless, we want a network. We don't. The suggestion now is not to make a marine protected area. Make oh, in the future we should be making networks of these systems. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just say that. Uh, uh, this is some data from uh, uh, folks looking at mostly rock fishes, but other fishes uh, on our California reefs. And what these guys found is that the vast majority of them uh, move less than uh, three kilometers. Uh, so, so most of our fish, even though the fish are moving a lot more on average than our invertebrates, they're moving not as far as maybe we, we think as adults, as adults, not, not dispersive phase, but as adults. So this is for how big should the reserve be. Um, uh, the worry is always about, or, 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 or we don't ever really have good answers for very wide ranging critters, far ranging, cruising around tunas and, and things like that, white sharks, things like that. We don't have good um, uh, stuff for that. Um, yeah. Do we harvest? We actively kill them. We've historically actively killed them. So one of the reasons why they're recovering now is because we've stopped, um, a gill, we, we, we've reduced gill nets. And we'll talk about more of that later. But, um, but uh, yeah, people hate sharks, uh, but, but it was more of an indirect killing than actively trying to slaughter them. But the, the fact remains, we knocked their populations down quite a bit. Um, so sorry, we're, we're going to show you with this. Uh, so OK, so this is. So, um, so we can talk about connectivity. When we talk about our channel islands, there's always a contra, there's a, not contra is not the right way. There's always a question as to, because we have some species that are only at the islands. We have some species that are both on the mainland and on the islands. And so the question is, are those individuals mixing? You know, are they, are they, are they moving from the land to the island, the island to the, the continent, et cetera? And so this is, this is a low connectivity uh, scenario, right? Where if you watch these guys, some of these guys move between islands, some of them move, but most are not, most of them are not, they're either gonna stay mainland or stay island. They're not gonna you know, traverse the, the channel, for example. In a high connectivity context for those species, we do have some species though that do, go, that do, move, that do move back and forth a lot, and there's a lot of mixing. So again, we would have a different size reserve if we had a low connectivity population versus a, a large connectivity population. Okay. Um, I think, I think rather than, maybe, yeah. Um, so I'll just say, well, what is, what is, maybe stop here in a second. 
And I'll just say that, um, how do we know this? We know this from empirical evidence, and this is from a lot of different colleagues, but mostly our colleagues at Long Beach State that have um, initially started this with sharks, migrated to white sharks, and, but also do things like um, sheephead and other relatively large fish species. And so what we're looking at is, this is our current uh, flavor of, of our protected areas. The, the uh, green indicate state waters, um, uh, or sorry, yeah, yeah, state waters. Uh, the blue indicates the sanctuary, the marine sanctuary, federal sanctuary. The red indicates our, our patchwork, our current network of protected areas. And the yellow are monitoring locations. Okay, so, so we have some of these uh, critters tagged now, and now we have these, and so there's a couple different categories. Some of these are um, constantly saying, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am. Others, other technology, um, there's sort of a, a query, like, you know, it'll, it'll, bounce, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, respond when we're, when we're near it, for example, kind of thing. So, um, and over time, they've been able to build larger and larger networks. And so we've been able to expand from like, a, a, like say a study you guys would do in a, in a specific location for a specific amount of time to get more and more networks. And now there's collaborators at different universities and other places. So now we're building larger networks to monitor uh, fish movement. And so this is what we see with some of the uh, large sharks um, where they start off uh, or at, at the time of the year when we have these big rookeries off of the Farallons and off of the sort of rocky coast of North, Northern California. Um, they will move down to our part of the world. Um, we'll also get uh, a movement from other parts of California up into our area. And so these, so we we'll both get these sharks that are pelagic that'll come up to, to um, uh, Santa Cruz, et cetera. Um, we do get movement of some of these large groupers between um, Catalina, between our di far away islands. So we've had individuals tagged in Catalina show up on Anacapa or um, Santa Cruz or in the waters around. And we've also seen cases where some of our rays, some of our cartilaginous uh, uh, fish have uh, go surprisingly way up the coast. So start down in, you know, basically San Diego area and come all the way up to Santa Barbara and then go back down to LA or that kind of stuff, right? So, so some of these critters do have very surprisingly large movements. And if we did not have these individuals tagged, we wouldn't know that. Again, we're constantly getting more information, but it's, we can't just up, or in a practical world, you can't just update the boundaries of the MPA, right? So we're doing our best to estimate this, then we install them and so while we maybe can't adapt the protected area, this, the boundaries of it, this does tell us if maybe we're not seeing the response of a particular species. This might explain why it's, not, it's working for some but not others, right? So we can use this data in, in a sort of a, a more honest evaluation of these things. Um, and then we have some species though, you know, same, you know, cartilaginous fish, same, you know, skates and rays, that don't move very far at all, right? Um, and then we, uh, we also have some spatial segregation. So this is all movement ecology, it's all very new. And this is really a field that's really matured or, or has be begun to mature in the last like 20 years. So we're still learning this. So we might also have some individuals, some individuals that might be site attached and some individuals that might move more. So it might not just be that the species always does X, there could be you know, um, and we see this most explicitly with, with the culture of certain killer whale pods. So we have some groups of killer whales that are like, hey, I'm hanging out here in this island. We're always feeding this island. Others are just out roving all the time. So there's, there's complexity in these organisms um, that, that we're starting to realize as well. Um, yeah, okay, right. Uh, and, 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 and with regards to white sharks in particular, we, we do see some segregation based on age. So we are one of the nursery grounds for, for baby sharks. So they're not born here, but they're where they hang out. They really love our sandy beaches in Ventura County. So like Ventura to like Hollywood Beach kind of area, that, that sort of shallow sandy shoals right behind the, break, right behind the breaking waves. 
So very few attacks on people, almost no attacks on people. They're not inter the, and these are juvenile sharks. So these are like yay big, these are like, you know, three foot, four foot sharks. These aren't like big honking guys. So these are mostly eating crustaceans, small fish. They're not, they're not interested in eating you at that life history stage. But, um, but we are also starting to realize that we have um, some segregation of, of different uh, adult life history stage. Yeah. Uh, 